Good evening. What a blessing it is to gather here as we conclude this awesome day of worship. What a great time that we get together each and every week to glorify our holy God and Savior. Amen. What a blessing it is to be here. If you're with us tonight, we welcome you. And if you will stay after a little bit so that way we can get to know you, you can get to know us as well. It's just such a blessing that we get to bookend the day with worship. But hopefully, when I say that word end, I don't mean that our worship ends. I mean like we continue all throughout the week. Let us praise and glorify his magnificent name for what he's done for us, what he's planned, what he had planned to do for humanity long before the foundation of the world, by which we are so thankful. And we want to share that with everyone around us, right? What a blessing it is to be here tonight. We've been going through a series about God. Uh, you know, I mean, that's kind of what you would expect to hear in church, right? Stuff talking about God. But specifically, we've been going through a series on God and his deity, the Godhead. We've been talking about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Two weeks ago, we looked at God the Father and saw how beautiful the beautiful message of the Father is. When we look at who the Father is, uh, his holy existence, the fact that he cares for us and wants us to be called his children, is so amazing. And tonight we're going to be looking at God the Son. You know, C.S. Lewis once penned that Jesus uh, could either be one of these three things, but he couldn't be, excuse me, uh, he penned that Jesus had, there were three things that Jesus could possibly be. Uh, there was Lord, liar, or lunatic. And if he was Lord, he couldn't be the other two, right? As a matter of fact, there's another way that he phrased it, a mad, bad, or God. Uh, he can't be mad, crazy, and be God, and so on and so forth. And as he was, putting that, as he was pointing that out, C.S. Lewis, when we think about what, who Jesus is, when we think about what he's done and his blessedness that he's poured out on us, man, when you look at the story of the Bible, it's so easy to look at the Bible as this, as this book that just has all these different scattered stories that at some point, you know, they, they kind of help each other, but they're just all these different isolated incidents. Absolutely not. When you look at the story of the Bible, what you find is the message of Jesus Christ. When you look from the book of Genesis all the way to Revelation, you find this golden thread that runs through it, the scheme of redemption, that God sent his son down to die on the cross for our sins. And tonight what we're going to be doing is looking at God the Son. And first and foremost, as we dive into this deeper, we want to first take note of one aspect of God the Son. The fact that He is, in fact, the eternal God. If you have your Bibles, I want us to look at Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. We'll look at Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. We're going to go through several verses tonight. There are so many different passages that we can be going to tonight, but we're going to, for time's sake, look at just several of them in, in this context. In Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, this is what Micah writes. And this is a prophecy relating to Jesus, the fact that he would be born in Bethlehem. But it says here, O you Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth from me, one who is to be ruler in Israel, who's coming forth. This is Jesus now. This is who they're talking about. This is the prophecy. It said, whose coming forth is from old, from the ancient of days. You know what the ancient of days in the Hebrew means? Everlasting. Who can be called everlasting than God himself? Who can be called from old? An individual that, pre, that doesn't dwell within the parentheses of time, but dwells before time, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. Micah declares that to be Jesus. As a matter of fact, if you have your Bibles, I want us to keep looking as we see in John. Let's look at John chapter 1 and verse 1. And John in his prologue, as we're looking at what John has to say in this matter, uh, the purpose of the book of John was to declare the deity of Jesus Christ, that he came into this world to save all of humanity. It wasn't just for the Jews, it wasn't isolating just for the Gentiles, but for all of humanity. And John opens up this book, opens up this gospel, saying this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I want to take note of several words here. That word was right there. Now remember, who is the Word? When we look at the Word, uh, John in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 13 says that the Word is Jesus. So this passage here uh, from John chapter 1 verse 1 through verse 18 is in reference to who Jesus would be. The Word became flesh and He dwelt among us. Uh, John chapter 1 and verse 14. But this idea of in the beginning was the Word. The Greek word therefore was, the way we translate it was, that Greek word denotes time existence. In other words, he transcends time. In the beginning was the Word. Now, who do we say the Word was again? According to Revelation chapter 19, we said it was Jesus, right? So if we substitute that phrase, Word, for Jesus, in the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with God, and Jesus was what? Jesus was God. Not saying Jesus is God-like, but in fact, he is God, the divine one. If you have your Bibles, we'll keep looking at some more verses. John chapter 10 and verse 30 through 38. John chapter 10 and verse 30 through 38. 
And John here records as Jesus is dealing with Jewish brethren who were skeptic of him. Uh, Jesus handling this as they were getting ready to pick up stones to cast at him. We begin reading, beginning in verse 30. It says, I and the Father, this is Jesus speaking, I and the Father are one. The Jews picked up stones, excuse me, the Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, it is not for good work that we are going to stone, excuse me, it is not for good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you being a man, make yourself God. If you notice in this entire passage, Jesus never once, uh, never once argues that he's not. He never once says to him, no, I never said that. What are you talking about? I never said that. We continue on, and Jesus answered them this way. He says, is it not written in your law, I said, you are gods? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said, I am the son of God. If I'm not doing the works of my father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you, excuse me, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the father is in me and I in him. I want to look at verse 39. Again, they sought to arrest him because he escaped from their hands. Uh, this phrase, son of God, even in this passage when he says, I am son of God, uh, every time he called himself that, they were filled with rage. You want to know why? Because that particular phrase, son of God, has only ever been referenced in the Jewish thought to the one who would be called the Messiah. And the only phrase, the idea of son of God, we're going to look at that even deeper, to the Jewish thought would have been a reference saying this individual says that he is the exact nature of God. It's not saying that he's merely just some byproduct of God but that he is God himself, that he holds the very essence of eternal being, that he is deity in nature, in attributes, in every aspect. I'm going to go ahead and keep looking as we break this down, as we look at what else uh, we read in the scriptures pertaining to Jesus being God. Colossians, if you turn in your Bibles, I want us to look at Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9, what Paul has to say on the matter. Paul in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9, writing this letter to the church at Colossae to encourage them to continue to be the Christians that Christ the Messiah died for. He says this, he says this about Jesus, for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. In other words, he inhabits, he is the very, very essence of what deity is all about. If you want to look at who God is, look no further than Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 6. Go ahead and keep turning. We're going to be looking at these passages quick, but if you'd like to write them down, they're up there on the screen. Normally I do uh, transitions, but I figured if you just want to go ahead and take those notes, you can while we're going through these. Philippians chapter 2 and in verse 6. And this is what Paul said. He's talking about Jesus. As a matter of fact, let's start back in verse 5. He says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. So remember, he's talking about Jesus here. Who is in Christ Jesus, excuse me, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Verse 6, Who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. You know what that means? In other words, though being God himself, he didn't see himself being God as the thing that would say, You know what? I'm God. I'm too good to go to earth. No, it says right here, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. We can go as far back, if you have your Bibles, to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3, where God is speaking to Moses in the wilderness, and in Exodus chapter 3, we'll pick up in verse 13 through verse 14. God has approached Moses, or rather Moses has approached God as God took on the form of the burning bush. And we read in verse 13, Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, Now this is God speaking to Moses. This is what he said. This is who you say I am. This is what they shall call me by. This is going to be the covenant name by which they shall know me as. He says, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. This name I am, Yahweh or Yehoah or Jehovah as we have, have translated uh, in English. Uh, that name right there denotes God and his deity. The fact that that name only belongs to which individual? Do multiple individuals in the Bible hold that name? Only one individual is deserving of that name. That's God Almighty. And yet you turn over to John chapter 8. If you have your Bibles, we're going to look at John chapter 8. Let's go ahead and see what John has to say about this in recording what Jesus himself said. In John chapter 8, the Jews are angry with Jesus because Jesus said that he transcends the time of Abraham. He quotes Abraham, and he says, Abraham, even look towards me. And they, they said, are, you're like 
you're only 30 years old, and you say that you know Abraham, that you existed before Abraham. And then he says to them, Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. He's not speaking in poor grammar there, okay? He's not saying before Abraham was, I am, because he didn't know how to speak proper English. He's saying I am because he knows what will go through their mind. The only individual that calls himself that in Scripture is who? Is God Almighty. That's why in the next verse, so they picked up stones to throw at him. Because if he's just a man, then what did he just commit? Blasphemy. But if he is God, and there's nothing blasphemous about what he said. But they couldn't handle that. As a matter of fact, it upset them that he called himself God. Because the way they envisioned God wasn't exactly the way Jesus measured up in their eyes. They created a God after their own image. As opposed to seeing God for who he truly was, manifested in the flesh as Jesus Christ. There are multiple other passages that we can look at. If you have your Bibles, Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 3. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 3. Now this is a messianic prophecy from Isaiah dealing with the coming of John the baptizer. And this is what he says. He says, a voice cries in the wilderness. Now who's that voice that Matthew chapter 3 and verse 3 says would cry out in the wilderness? John, right? Uh, this is a prophecy. As a matter of fact, Matthew quotes it in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 3. And this is what he says. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Now, Lord here, maybe in your Bible, it's all caps, right? Uh, Yahweh, Jehovah God, the one true God. And then in the next verse, it says, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. You turn to Matthew chapter 3 and verse 3. The, pro or excuse me, the writer Matthew attributes this verse saying, this is what John did. And look who ends up coming along the way. Jesus Christ himself. Who did, Jesus, who did John come to prepare the way for? He came to prepare the way for Yahweh, according to this prophecy. Who's Yahweh? Matthew attributes it, Matthew chapter 3, to Jesus Christ. We keep looking at further passages in dealing with this, in dealing with his, with his deity. John chapter 20, in the closing remarks of John, or in the closing uh, chap verses of John, in John chapter 20, and we're going to look at verse 24 through 28. We're going to see what John has to say. John has tons of verses like this in his gospel account, again, uh, because he wanted the, Jew, the Jews and the Gentiles to see that this was, the one who came was the one true God. And in John chapter 20, we're going to go ahead and pick up in verse 24. Now, this is Jesus has already, uh, uh, this Jesus has already resurrected from the dead. He's appeared before 11 of the disciples, but there's one disciple who hasn't seen him yet. That's Thomas. We read in verse 24, Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have, excuse me, we have seen, uh, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hand the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand in his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came, and he stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your fingers here and see my hands and put out your hand and place them in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him. Now, once again, if you look at the Greek, the article that he's talking, he's going to use this next phrase to is to the one he's talking to, to him. Then Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Thomas saw him and he couldn't help but to give him the glory that he deserved as being Lord and God, only one individual in Scripture is referenced as Lord, as far as Lord in the context of being the Lord of the universe. That's God. And yet Jesus is called Lord and God. Now, as we continue on, we'll keep breaking this down. Several other passages to break through as we look through this. Uh, we look at Isaiah chapter 43. In Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 11, the prophet Isaiah there says uh, that apart from God, there is no Savior. Okay, this is what's interesting. Apart from God... There is no Savior. But if you look at Titus chapter 1 and verse 3, I want you, if you will, let's turn over there together to Titus chapter 1 and verse 3. We'll go ahead and see what Paul writes to Titus. In Titus chapter 1 and verse 3, now remember, Isaiah the prophet, God speaking through Isaiah the prophet, says there's only one Savior, right? He says, I am the Savior. There's no other Savior but God. And in Isaiah, or excuse me, in Titus chapter 1 and verse 3, this is what Paul writes. And at that proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God, our Savior. So Paul agrees with Isaiah, right? Does he in this verse? That God is the Savior? But then you look at verse 4. To Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Savior. Here's a question. If there is no other Savior than God, and if Jesus is called our Savior, then who is Jesus? Is there more than one Savior? 
But there are two saviors. Oh, Jesus is the savior. God is the savior. And thus, Jesus is God. Uh, titles like Lord, Savior, the Creator, the Shepherd can only be attributed to God. To call anyone else who is not God by these things is blasphemous. For example, uh, the, uh, the, the writer of Psalm 23, David, in Psalm 23 and verse 1, he says, The Lord is my what? He says, the Lord is my shepherd. Only one individual can be called the shepherd. We're not talking about shepherds like elders. We're not talking about shepherds like in the sense of David, his occupation. We're talking about the shepherd, the shepherd of humanity. And yet, what does Jesus call himself in John chapter 10 and verse 11? The good shepherd. So the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord, that word there, Lord, in Psalm 23 is reference to God Almighty, is a reference to Yahweh and then you jump to what Jesus said. So is Jesus taking a title that doesn't belong to him? Or does it rightly belong to him because he's God Almighty? Absolutely. We keep looking at other verses. Even Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 20 denotes that Jesus is the shepherd. Uh, Jesus is also known as the creator. In John chapter 1 and verse 3, uh, in him all things were made that were made. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 6, Colossians chapter 1. If you will, let's turn over there to Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 through 17. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16 through verse 17. And this is what Paul says in Colossians chapter 1. He says in verse 16, for by him, he's talking about Jesus over here. He says, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authority, all things were created through him. That word through, by him. All things were created through him, by him, and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Another example, you know, Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2 says the church belongs to God. Now, we know that there's only one head of the church, right? You know, Paul also would say in Romans chapter 16 and verse 16, the church belongs to Jesus. So are there two heads if Jesus is separate from God? There's only one head, because Jesus is God. Paul in Colossians chapter 1 verse 18, the next verse from here, would say that he is the head of the church, of his body, the church. So do Jesus and God, are they these two separate entities that function as two heads of the same body? Absolutely not. It's one God. We look at other passages like Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. That's a messianic prophecy. We, from that verse, that's where we get Prince of Peace, Right? But you know, in that verse, in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, you know what the prophet Isaiah says? He shall be called everlasting God. The same verse by which we attribute the name Prince of Peace to Jesus, he also says, you know what else he's going to be called? He's going to be called everlasting God. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 22 through 25, the angel told Joseph that he shall call his name what? Emmanuel. Why? Because God with us. How does God dwell with us? As his son. As the Son, Jesus Christ. We're going to look at another thing. Not only is he the eternal God, but also there's several quotes that go from the first and second century. For example, uh, Ignatius of Antioch, who was believed to be a disciple of John, according to tradition and historians, said, God himself was manifest in the human form for the renewal of eternal life. Continue in intimate union with Jesus Christ, our God. Clement of Rome, who many scholars believe is the same Clement that Paul talked about in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 3. And he said, brethren, it is fitting that you should think of Jesus Christ as God, as the judge of the living and the dead. Now, again, these are just quotes from men, but we can go through a host of more scriptures. Uh, the passages that I just showed you, these are just several passages that reference. This is a lot. These are just several references that deal with Jesus Christ as deity. Here's the thing. If it was blasphemous for Jesus to call himself God, for Jesus to be called God, so much so that the Jews would stone him, they called it blasphemy, right? Jesus never once says to them, uh, no, that's not who I am. Never argues that with them. Why? Because that's who he is. If it's blasphemous to call somebody who is God not God, then isn't it blasphemous to say that somebody is God and say that they're not? You get what I'm saying? See, we've got to, when we look at passages like this, we've got to see that Jesus Christ is in his rightful place as one of the members of the Godhead. But also, he is the Son of God. Uh, son in scripture, depending on the context, means simply one possessing the nature of something. For example, John and James were called sons of thunder. Barnabas was called son of encouragement. Uh, does that mean that thunder literally produced John and James or Barnabas was procreated by encouragement? Absolutely not. 
What it means is that they bear those traits that those things are known for, that they bear those attributes, that they embody those things in which thunder and encouragement represent. What you're saying, Barnabas, son of encouragement, you know what you're saying he is? You're saying that he is, when you look at encouragement, look at Barnabas. So when you say Jesus is son of God, when you look at him, you know what you're saying? He is God. Uh, think about that. Uh, when we think about the idea of son of God, Jesus is not son of God in the sense that he was physically procreated by God. But on the other hand, Jesus is clearly the son of God because he bears the very nature of who God is. Jesus' repeated claim to be the son of God was consistently understood by the Jews as blasphemous, as being equal with God, which Jesus never once denied. You can look at John chapter 5, verse 17 through 23. John 8, verse 58. We looked at that earlier. John 8, 58 through 59. John chapter 10, verse 30 through 39. John 19, and verse 7. Matthew chapter 26, verse 63 through 65. Jesus is therefore God's son, not God's creation, not God's agent. Jesus is God's son who, though being God, became a servant servant for our sake. You look at John chapter 13, Jesus himself says that in chapter 13, verse 13 through 15. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 8, Paul emphatically reminds us that though being God, he did not account, he didn't see that being God would made, him, made him too much up here that he couldn't come down to earth to save us. God himself came down in the form of man, taking on the form of flesh. The Word, remember, the Word is God, right? That's what John chapter 1 and verse 1 says. The Word is God. The Word has always been God. Again, that Word means the Word always has been God. And the Word, according to John chapter 1 and verse 14, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. Why? Because He is the Son of God. As the Son, He is equal with the Father and the Spirit in nature, but He serves a different role and thus chose to become submissive to the Father to serve. Remember, he constantly said when he came to earth, my will, is to do the Father, uh, the, my will is to do the will of the Father who sent me, right? My food is to do the will of the Father who sent me. But does that mean that he's less than God? For example, according to what Paul, what Paul, wrote, into the, uh, what Paul wrote to the Galatians as well as the church at Colossae, uh, you know that there is neither male nor female, neither slave nor free, but all are one in Christ Jesus. So male and female, on the, in the eyes of God, they're equal, but don't they serve different roles? especially in the church and things like that. Does that make women less than men? Does that make men greater than women? Does that make men less than women? And so on and so forth. No. It, just because the Father, the Son, the Spirit, they have different roles in their function of salvation and in eternity doesn't mean one is less than the other and one is least important than the other and one is less God and one is bigger God. No, absolutely not. Because they either are all God or there's multiple gods, because they're all called everlasting. They're call, all called eternal. And we don't believe that, right? Because there's only one God. That's what Paul reminds us of in Romans chapter 4. We keep looking at the fact that uh, he is not only the eternal God, he is the Son, but also he's the Savior. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. Uh, I was talking in my in my Bible class this morning to the teens, in Genesis chapter 3, we see, uh, we see sin. We see man fell, right? Genesis chapter 1 and 2 are the most peaceful chapters of the Bible until Jesus comes. But everything in between that is just absolute chaos. And in Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve fall, right? They succumb to temptation. And yet in that passage, in verse 15, we find the first prophecy of the Messiah, of the one who would come to save humanity, that through him... In his seed, excuse me, through the seed of woman, he shall, he shall crush the head of the serpent. You jump to Genesis chapter 12, and, just, and in Genesis chapter 12, that says verse 5 through 8, but Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 through verse 5, uh, God reminds Abraham of that same promise. Except he said, through your seed, all nations will be blessed. You jump to Genesis chapter 49, verse 8 through 12. We see that as, ja as Jacob is giving his blessings to his sons, to Judah, he says, the scepter shall never be removed from you. And he calls him the lion. Why? Because Jesus would come from the family of Judah, the ultimate king, the king of kings and lord of lords, from the family in which kings would descend and be the lion. As a matter of fact, Moses prophesies of the coming of the Messiah in Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 18, in which he says there would come a prophet that would be raised up, and from him will come the words of God. Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 1, Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 5 through 6, Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44, uh, Daniel chapter 7 and verse 13 through 14 says that Jesus would come specifically from the family of David and establish an everlasting kingdom. 
Not a kingdom like a kingdom on earth in the sense of a physical kingdom with landmass. Remember his disciples asked him if he was going to do that in Acts chapter 1. And the kingdom did come. It came in Acts chapter 2. And you and I are a part of it today. Isaiah 53 says that he would become the sacrificial lamb that would die on the cross for our sins. Jesus is God. Jesus, not only being God, Jesus is the son of God. And Jesus is, thank God, he is the savior. Because without Jesus, what hope do we have? That's what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. That without what he did, we would be miserable. But thanks be to God, as he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through whom? Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Without Jesus, it is impossible to be mediated back to God. That's what Paul reminds us of in 1 Timothy chapter 2, and verse 5, that there is one God and one mediator between man and God, the man Christ Jesus. Without Jesus, what hope do we have? And praise be God, just like those shepherds in the field. You read in the book of Luke, how they rejoiced because glory had once returned to the world. The glory of God himself in the form of Jesus Christ. Everybody knows John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, God demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, who died for us? Christ Christ, that word Christ comes from, uh, it means anointed one. It comes from the Hebrew uh, idea of Messiah. It means one who bears the essence of the king, of the one true king, God Almighty. Jesus coming down to earth, leaving his abode in heaven, came down to earth because he loved us so much. That's powerful. The fact that God saw man fall and the fact that man violated God's covenant, but God himself, long before the foundation of the world, had a plan, and that plan was he was going to come down and become flesh and die for us. To bleed, to suffer, to be beaten, to be tormented. Because death had to take place, right? The shedding of blood is what makes atonement for sin. That's the reason why in Leviticus chapter 16, as well as in Leviticus chapter 1 through 7, you see the day of atonement in Leviticus chapter 16, the animal sacrifices in Leviticus chapter 1, representing that because of sin, blood must be shed. And Jesus said, let it be me. Jesus said, my blood can atone perfectly for humanity. The church is purchased by his blood. Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. Paul would remind us constantly, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Uh, Ephesians. Man, Jesus is amazing. And the fact that he would come down to this small little sphere suspended in the universe because every single person who has ever lived on that planet, every single person who will ever live on that planet, every single person who has ever suffered on that planet, every single person, even people who have abused people on that planet, he loves. And he wants, to be a part of, he wants them to be a part of his family. That's powerful. You know what makes it even more amazing? That Jesus is not some afterthought. That Jesus is not some byproduct of God. That Jesus is not just some mere creation from God. That Jesus is not another man like you and I. But that Jesus is in fact God himself and came down in the flesh to die for my sins. That is amazing. And we should be praising God and his holy name for that. Amen. If you're here this evening, and if you're outside of Christ, you have a God who immensely loves you. You have a God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, who loves you dearly and has desired for you to live your life to the fullest that it possibly could be lived. That's the way he's designed us to live. But I can't live my life to the fullest if I don't live the way my life was intended from the beginning. And how was my life intended to be lived from the beginning? To live with God, to dwell in peace and unity with him. I can't do that without Jesus Christ. I can't do that apart from him. 
Apart from him, there's only alienation. But just like the way Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 2, he says, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even while we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Why? Because of God's infinite mercy. And his mercy is extended to you tonight. Let me tell you, the blessing about being a Christian, if you are in Christ, is that you have the grace of God, but do not, like Paul says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound. Don't falter from that. Don't think because you have grace that means that you can live however you want to live. No, it's possible to fall from grace. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 4, Paul says to them, you have fallen from grace, you who would be justified by the law. You're severed from Christ. If you feel like that's you tonight, if you feel like you've, you're falling and drifting and drifting and drifting away from the one true God, Jesus Christ died for you too. Obviously, you're in Christ, so you know that. But his death is still significant in the life of the Christian. His resurrection is still significant in our lives, amen? We celebrate it every single week. But it's so easy to lose sight of that. No matter how many times we may observe this every single week, it's still so easy to forget, right? Don't lose sight of your Lord and Savior. If you have, we encourage you to come forward and to do so as together we stand and as we sing.